Well, guys, I have a, a bit of a confession to make, okay? Um, I, I talk nerd stuff with you every so often, okay? Many of you know that I'm a big nerd. I, I really love Star Wars stuff. I, um, of course, the what I'm talking about today, the Marvel stuff, I'm a big fan of this. And, and this weekend was a big weekend because uh, Avengers Infinity War, yep, came out. Look at, listen to that. Yeah, do you hear that? Do you get what a big deal this is? See, some of you don't get it. Some of you don't understand because you haven't really watched any of it. But guys, this is a big deal. I mean, we saw Thanos like eight years ago or something like that for the first time when he appeared on the end screen, end title of the first Avengers movie, and we've been waiting around to see what Thanos is going to do, and finally he's going to appear, and everyone's together. I mean, for crying out loud, the Spider-Man movie was awesome. He's in it. The Guardians of the Galaxy movies were great. They're in it. Of course, Thor Ragnarok was hilariously awesome, you know, and they're all, of course, they're all in it too. I mean, the cast is just huge. It's strong. They're doing well, and, and the reviews so far that I've heard are just skyrocketing. It's just, it just killed it. They did it, but guys, here's the deal. i got to confess something. I mean, I went to the first, I went to the midnight openings of half of these movies, okay? Half of these Marvel movies, if not more. But guys, I, I find myself not feeling this burning desire to go see it. Yeah, some of you should be slack-jawed right now. Whoa. If you've been in my office, you know I have like all this Hulk paraphernalia and stuff. I got a Thor hammer. I got all the Captain America posts. I got all this stuff, right? But I got to confess something. I, I don't know why. I mean, I'll go see it, right? My family, though, keeps asking about it more than me. And I'm like, yeah, we'll go to it. They're like, Dad, when are we going to go see it? Aren't you excited? Yeah, yeah, we'll go to it. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? Am I growing up? <laughs> right? What is going on? Well, the thing is, is, is what I've noticed, there's... There's something, there's a principle about life that rings true to all people. Now, I get bored easy, period, right? So I know that I might be a little bit more of an extreme example of this, but guys, the stuff of this world loses its savoriness, loses its sweetness, and loses its ability to satisfy. Case in point, Lord of the Rings, right? I remember when Lord of the Rings, the movies came out for Lord of the Rings. Again, I had... I had obsessed over this movie, obsessed over these movies that were coming out, right? I remember watching the first trailer for Lord of the Rings frame by frame. Do you know what that means? That's, I mean, we're not even like, 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 I'm clicking on it half a step, half a step, half a step, half a step to engage in every single photo of, I mean, it took me forever to get through that thing, but I didn't want to miss I th I'm looking in the background. I'm looking for hidden stuff. I mean, I was obsessing over this, right? And, and Lord of the Rings is something that had been a part of, my ha part of my life for years. My mother read those books to us as we would go on long trips, right? I mean, that's, and so I have this love for this stuff. But once again, the other day, Miranda was like, you know what we need to do? We need to watch Lord of the Rings. It's been forever since we watched it. I'm like, yeah. There's something in life. And it's a, it's a thing that hits us all, okay? And, and you know this is true because how many times have you been excited for something and it finally came and now you've kind of forgotten about it, right? That things just have a way, not just things, but events, circumstances, even other relationships have a way of losing their satisfaction. Why is that? Today we're going to talk about that. Today we're going to look into a very important scripture from Christ. But before we do, now I know, I, this, when I do the announcements and the communion and the offering and all that kind of stuff, it's like, man, we pray after everything and before everything, right? Well, then, uh, so, so I think when we do this, we got to remember why we're praying, okay? We pray before worship because we want to prepare our hearts to honor God, right? We pray before communion because we want to make sure we thank him. We pray for our offering because we want to ask God to bless it, right? Right now, we're going to pray because it's your chance to push aside stuff to hear from God's word, okay? To ask yourself the question, am I ready to hear from God today? Are you? Are you ready to hear from God today? If you're not quite there yet, this is your chance. This is your chance to ask God to speak to you. Let's pray. God, as we open your holy word, as the truth of life comes before us, we want your will to be done. We want your kingdom to come. 
I don't want my words to get in your way, God. So put in the things I'm missing. Take out the things you don't want because we just want you. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. You are the great I am. And as we come before you, may all the sin and the shame and the pain and the anxiety and the circumstances of life and the difficulties in relationships, Lord, I pray that all that would melt away in your presence. Jesus, you've offered to take it all, to carry our burdens with us. And so we come before you expecting that. We come before you expecting you to light up our world a bit, to reveal more of ourselves, our true selves, to us so that we might know who we are more. And Lord, we want to know you. It's this infinite struggle. It's this infinite pursuit to know you. But Lord, you are an infinite God, and you have so much of, it, of yourself to reveal to us, Lord. I pray we would know you better as we open up your word. It's in your name we pray. Amen. We're going to be in John 15. John 15, starting in verse 1. Now, these verses are some, i got to admit, I mean, if I had some pet verses, if I had some verses that have really spoken to me in my life, made a tremendous difference in my personal life, John 15 is just one of them. This, this verse has had a tremendous impact on the way that I live and the way that I look at God and the way that I look about what's important, the priorities that I have in life. Guys, this is one of some of the best teaching from Christ. Now, it's some of the best teaching because this is like last moments with his disciples before he's going to go to the cross. If you have a last final word to say to the guys who have been following you around and you, you want to make sure they remember something, you're going to put it in those last bits before they go through this trauma. They're about to go and watch their, this, this guy that they've been following, this, mi this miracle worker that they've been following, the one that they believe is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God. They're about to watch him get nailed onto a cross. And so Jesus gives them words, gives them words to, so they might remember who he is, so they might, they might remember what it means to, to have a relationship with him. And so when you understand, especially when you understand these words in the context, in the context of, of, of a Jewish uh, understanding of God, man, these are powerful, powerful words. John 15, starting in verse 1. I am the true vine. And my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither you, neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is, my this is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Now let's break that down a little bit, okay? There are three major players in these verses. There is the vine, there is the gardener, and there are the branches. The vine is Jesus Christ. The gardener is God, the Father, okay? and we are the branches. Now, each of these players have an important job, and Jesus has laid it out, what their purpose is and why they exist. Jesus, the vine, is there to provide nourishment, to sustain the branches, and to produce fruit in the branches. That is his job, to sustain, to provide, to care for, and to produce in us the fruit. The gardener's job. The gardener actually has a lot in here. He has like one verse, but his job is jam-packed full of stuff. First, it is his job to look for the fruit. Okay? And then it is his job, if he doesn't see fruit, to cut off branches that don't produce fruit. And then he looks to the branches that are producing fruit, and he prunes them so that they can create better fruits. That's, this, is a, this is a normal gardener's thing. that ha I mean, if you drink grape juice, if you drink wine, this is, this is still the process today. It is a, it is a modern day thing. I, I, I looked it up to make sure that I wasn't speaking any false information to you. You can get on YouTube and find out all this stuff, okay? When someone, is, when someone is growing grapes, what they do with their vines is that they have a branch coming off, and that branch gets one bunch of grapes. 
one bunch of grapes each because it'll create better sugar content, it'll create plumper grapes, it'll create bigger uh, bunches of grapes. So the gardener will prune everything off but one, but one bunch. Now, we'll talk more about that later. Now, check this out, though, okay? So if it is the gardener's job to look for the fruit, to cut off stuff that's not providing fruit, then that means he's also the one that harvests the fruit. And this is really important, especially that last verse. It is the gardener's job to, to, uh, uh, to benefit from the harvest, right? Okay? It is the gardener's job, it is the gardener's responsibility, and it is the gardener's pleasure to benefit from the harvest. Now, we'll talk more about each of those things, but first let's talk about the branches, you and me. If it is the vine's job to sustain, provide, to uh, create fruit, if it is the gardener's job to, to look for the fruit and, and, and harvest and benefit from it, then what do the branches actually do? What is their job? What is their purpose as we look at this verse? Well, Jesus is actually very clear. In fact, he repeated himself many, many times over. It'd be, uh, it'd be really easy for us to think, well, it's my job to produce fruit, right? Because if the fruit's coming off of me, it's my job to produce fruit. But that's not what he said, it was it? You know, when we come to church, it's often the lie, it's often the, 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 the pressure and the, and, the, and, and the stress that we put on ourselves that we got to be the best people and we got to be the good people and that we got to stop doing all the bad things and start doing all the right things. Does God want to do that in your life? Absolutely, he does. But the lie that we believe is that it's up to us to do it. That it's our responsibility to do it. Did you know that that lie is what drives most people away from church? It drives a lot of people away from church. That I got to do what's right, and I got to avoid doing what's wrong. That so many people, that's what they would sum up so much of what we do at Hope, at, at Hope Summit Christian Church. If they don't know our church, if they've never been here and they look at our church, they're going to think, well, they're just going to try to, they're going to get me to do a list of rights and avoid a list of wrongs. But the truth what Jesus very clearly said, our job, our purpose, is simply one thing, to remain on the vine, to abide in the vine. That's it. Does that take a little bit of pressure off for some of y'all? I hope so. Because some of you are walking in here today saying, I am not a good person because I did this and this and this. I am not worthy of God's love. I cannot. It's amazing how many people in their hearts of hearts believe that they're not worthy of the love of God because of things that they have done. Guys, the purpose is not to get good behavior. Now, I'm kind of rehashing some things we've already talked about, right? We've been talking about how Jesus said, well, if you love me, obey my commandments. And how is we so often we focus on the commandments part, but really the focus is on the love part. That the most important, the priority is that we get that figured out. How do we love God? Do I love God? Do I want this relationship with him? Because he will then produce the fruit in that relationship into my life, right? So this isn't about behavior. This isn't about God coaxing us into good behavior. This is about a God who wants to win our hearts. And now he calls us to remain. Remain with me. Now what's interesting is that this principle works. Okay, When we talk about how, how if we remain in Christ, he will produce the fruit in our life. When we remain in Christ, we will find satisfaction in him. The reason this principle works is because of what Jesus said in the first four, uh, sorry, five words. Okay? If you have your Bibles, look at it again. The first five words of this, uh, of this section of Scripture are the most important part of all this. Jesus repeats himself over and over about remaining in me, and that is absolutely important. But, to, but we got to understand what he's saying when he says, I am the true vine. In his context, when he's talking to his disciples, what does that mean? And how does that relate to you and me today? First of all, Let's look at those first two words. What are the first two words? I am. 
Those are very significant words. Those would be incredibly significant words to Jesus' disciples because the I am name is a God-only name. It was a name that God gave to himself when, 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 uh, when, when he called Moses to go and free, free the, he, the Hebrews from the Egypt when they were in slavery. Okay? When, when, he, when Moses said, who should I say is sending me? He says, tell them I am. What an odd name, but also what a God-sized name. I am. No one else can claim that name because we aren't. We don't. We can't. We won't. But God is the I am. It gives us this, I mean, even just just to say that I am gives this idea of always will be. Always has been. Before all things, after all things, through all things. I just am in all of it. It is a God-sized name. It is a God-sized claim to say I am. And what's really interesting is that in John in particular, okay, John, man, what a great <laughs> what a great writer, okay? Well, I should say, good job, John, but like well done, Holy Spirit, inspiring John, because that's what we believe, okay? John has seven I am statements, okay? He has seven I am statements from Christ. Sorry, buddy. I can't take questions right now. I'll talk to you later, okay, bud? Okay. He has seven I am statements. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection of life. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the true vine. Now, again, to a Jewish mindset, this is important. Because to their understanding, the number seven was a number of completion. You ever heard that, like, seven is God's number? He uses it a lot in his word. Because it's a number of completion. It's a number of of finishing off. And so when Jesus said, I mean, when John when John puts in there that this is the last I am statement of Christ, this is the one that completes it all. In fact, when you truly understand what it means that he is the true vine, it actually kind of fits the other six inside of it. So this is kind of the totality of what Jesus is trying to say. This is who I am. And he uses this example of this tree branch. And remember, what is the tree branch's job? I mean, the tree vine, sorry, the, the vine's job. What is the vine's job? But to sustain, okay, to, to care for and to produce fruit. Now, we've already talked about during communion what a bold statement this is, right? What a bold statement for Jesus to say that I am the bread of life. I am the living water. That apart from me, you can't live. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Those are bold statements of Christ. Because what he is saying is that unless I am in your life, unless you are in me, you're never going to find satisfaction. You're always going to be hungry. You're always going to be thirsty. You're going to go from one thing to the next thing to the next thing to the next thing with this void in your life that's never going to be filled. And he is quietly, constantly saying, I am the true vine. I will satisfy. I will provide. I will produce in you. The reason this is a bold statement. Okay, now this is where I get a little cynical, I think. Okay? The reason this is the bold statement is because you can look into the lives of many people who are not in this room right now, who are not in any kind of church right now, and they seem to be doing just fine, right? Can we be honest with ourselves here for a moment? There are plenty of people living this life right now who seem to be doing just fine on their satisfaction level. They're happy with the lives that they're living. They're happy with the stuff that they're pursuing. They don't seem to have this hunger and this thirst that Jesus is talking about. What about them? Because if this is true, Jesus, if you are truly the only thing that can satisfy, shouldn't we be able to see it? Well, let's take a deeper look at this. Okay, because if if the claims of Christ are true, Okay, that he is the only thing to satisfy. Let's look at other things in our lives that we look to for satisfaction and see if they can satisfy the way that we're hoping. Okay? 
So I have a bunch of things here that I have listed out that we go to for satisfaction, okay? We go to these things looking for some sort of satisfaction, okay? How about our physical health, our body image? I know some people right now who are working very, very, very hard. I'm not, okay? I know some people are working really, really hard, and they do. I will see them on Facebook, and I feel guilty. Or I, I should feel inspired, but I just feel guilty, okay? That, that they um, are working really, really hard. But I don't know about you, but I've seen some people who have worked so hard that you can tell, like, this is like trying, they're trying to feel something right now in their life. But as we know, as we continue to watch, we know that ultimately, well, we're going to get old and the body's going to fall apart. And so eventually the satisfaction that brings is going to disappear. Now, if you get one of these, hold on to it, okay? I almost had, I almost had all of you move to these front rows so that I could make you catch this stuff, okay? Oh, I just, I already did this one. Okay, how about this? Eating, okay? This is a big one for me. <laughs> when you are looking for satisfaction, sometimes it's just as nice to eat good food. How satisfying is it to eat good food, right? Absolutely it is. Some of us call it stress eating, though, right? Because at the end of the day, it still isn't going to satisfy, okay? Some of us go to drinking. Some of us go to drugs. There's a reason why this stuff is so addicting. And, and believe me, if you have ever faced an addiction of alcohol abuse or, or substance abuse of any kind, you know, you know that it is a temporary relief from the satisfaction that you are truly looking for. So this stuff still doesn't satisfy. Modifying our look. When I say modifying our look, I mean, is it, sometimes doesn't it just feel good to look nice with better clothes, with nicer shoes, with uh, better makeup, whatever it is. Sometimes it just feels good. And we get a sense of satisfaction from looking good, do we not? From having the nice clothes, from looking, the, when someone says, boy, you sure look nice, I like that outfit, or I like what you did that. But again, at the end of the day, you're going to take those clothes off, right? This one I know might seem silly, but guys, we live in a culture addicted to our phones. Why? Why do we have in a culture addicted to our phones? Because we are looking to satisfy a hunger or a thirst. Let alone the fact that when I get the new iPhone, it's kind of cool. Okay? Feels nice. Okay? There we go. Social media is a big one. We especially have a generation growing up on, on uh, social media, and we are already seeing the results of how unsatisfying it actually is. Okay, yeah, it's really cool. It's really awesome that my friends from high school and I can talk to each other still, relive the old days, and reconnect, and it's really nice to be able to see what's going on in people's lives. I really like Facebook as a pastor because I can look and see if something is going okay in your life or not. Your status updates tell me more about yourself than you think. I appreciate it. And people are getting addicted to it. But does it satisfy? Does it satisfy, church? Well, Nancy, I almost hit you in the head. But you were like solid. Like this thing went, whew, and she didn't even blink. It was amazing. <laughs> Props, Nancy. Well done. Again, if I throw it out to you, hold on to it, because we're going to use it in just a second. Our digital image connected to our social media. There are people whose lives exist around lying to the people on their social media site about who they are. You know why? There's something satisfying about it. We all do it. We all, put, we all present the best version of ourselves. We all try to present the best version of ourselves. You know why? Because it's satisfying. Music, this one's a big one for me. I love music. I spend so much time listening to music. I have worked really hard to make sure that I constantly can have any music that I want at any time. Whether I'm in my car, whether I'm in my office, whether I'm walking around. Guys, I have a backpack and I carry a, I have a, uh, a speaker that hangs out with me right here. So I can just always have music. But eventually one day again, the music stops. Right? The music stops. If you get two ammo, you can hand them around, Okay. Movies, TVs, I mean, I just kind of talked about this. I mean, 
it's fun to go to a new movie. I'm, I am going to enjoy the new uh, Avengers movie, okay? I really am, but the movie ends. Video games, let me tell you something. There is something awesome about sniping some guy in Halo and dropping them in just a moment, okay? You know what I'm talking about. Some of you have no idea because you never played Halo. Boy, I'll tell you, there's something satisfying about beating the snot out of one of your friends on a video game. It's awesome. It's addicting. It's a lot of fun. Dan is like my, he's just going to keep throwing it back to you guys. All right. How about your car? You ever notice how there's some people who have like a super awesome car and their houses are like trash? There's something very satisfying about having a really, really nice car. Relationships. We can find satisfaction in relationships. We really can. And this one is hard. Some of you are thinking, Jeff, this shouldn't be on the temporary satisfaction list. But guys, you know as well as me how quickly a relationship can end. Whether that be with your family, whether that be with a boyfriend or a girlfriend, or whether you be with your friends. Guys, at some point, none of these relationships are solid. I mean, we try to do that. We try to do it with, uh, by, you know, putting rings on people, right? I mean, we, we, we try to m- make sure that they're not going to ever leave us, okay? But, guys, at the end of the day, most of our relationships still, at some point, something could happen and they could be gone, okay? Let's talk about your reputation. Some people find a lot of satisfaction in their reputation, in looking good and looking awesome, okay? How about your personality? Some people find a lot of satisfaction in who they are. This is just me. I'm going to act the way that I'm going to act because... Some people have like a chip on their block about, well, I'm just me. You're just going to have to deal with it, man. You're going to have to deal with it. How about your talents and abilities? Man, this is one of the things that when I was growing up, I would feel nervous in social situations. I would feel I wouldn't like myself at certain times, and I would remind myself that I'm a drummer. Okay? And that would make me feel better. I would be satisfied in that because drummers are cool. Right, Dan? <laughs> Dan is such a good drummer. You guys don't even know. Okay? <laughs> Keep handing them back. Toss them back, Emma. Make sure they get them. How about our jobs? How many people find satisfaction in the thing that you do, right? We can look for satisfaction in our jobs. But again, Tommy boy, how quickly can a job disappear? Right? How about your grades? Man, some of you in school spend so much time trying to get the best possible grade. And when you look at your card, when you look at your score, there is something very satisfying about it. And so you strive and you strive and you strive because you're looking for the good grades. But once again, at the end of the day, some punk who never went, to, who never finished high school is going to get a better job than you. Okay? How about this? What side of the, what, are, yeah. what side of town we live on? Some people become very satisfied with their living conditions, right? Uh, how about what kind of house that you live in? Some people are very satisfied with the kind of home that they have, right? And they take great satisfaction in knowing, okay, knowing the place they they, they live is a nice place and what that means to everyone. Our hobbies. I mean, don't we just love the things that we do on our free time? Like, I'm a gamer, I'm a nerd. I love this stuff because it's very satisfying, okay? But again, at the end of the day, how about your favorite sports, okay, or your favorite sports team? Now, man, I'll tell you what, sports have got something figured out. When football season comes around, people are pumped up again, you know, but they, they're really good at selling their product, okay? They don't let you stay in sports forever, and then they constantly have new people hired, and they constantly have, have uh, um, you know, new games, and it's, it's amazing how, boom, that can be very satisfying to watch. But again, once again, the Super Bowl's done, and then everyone's like, oh, I miss that football. Books, some people... You know, they find a lot of satisfaction in the books that they read, and reading is just very, very fun, and it's very enjoyable. Sex, of course, is one that we go towards. Um, Here, we got to make sure everyone in the front definitely has one, okay? Yeah. (laughs) Okay? Some people love to win at debates or just win in general. That can be very satisfying, okay? Why do you think we have such problems on Facebook and on social media about politics and stuff like that, right? I mean, the reason we, it's because we like to win. We like to debate. This is another one, religious practices. You can make yourself feel great by doing Christian stuff, okay? But at the end of the day, it's still not going to be the thing to satisfy you. Your dreams, some of you live for your dreams. Some of you live for your goals, okay? But at the end of the day, I wonder, 
is it truly going to satisfy? Does everyone in the front row have one? Okay, here's what I need you to do. I need you to take those. We're going to have some fun real quick. We're going to have some fun. I was just throwing this at you guys, right? Now I want you to throw them back at me. Okay. One, two, three, go. (laughs) Boom. (laughs) Now here's the deal. Here's the deal. Do these things, let's be honest, these many things that we pursue, do they provide satisfaction? Of course they do. Of course they do. We go for them, right? Of course we want them. Uh, If they didn't satisfy us, why would we go after them, right? They do provide satisfaction. But does it ever lose its taste? Do you ever find yourself wanting more? Do you ever find yourself realizing there's just not enough? Folks, the truth we got to recognize. All this stuff can be taken from us. We can lose it. We can lose the most important relationships. We can lose our job. We can even lose sight of our goals and our dreams and our hopes, our desires. All these things can be taken from us. The reason why Jesus Christ, when he says, I am the true vine, the reason why he's the only one that can say that he can truly satisfy is because he's the only eternal thing. He's the only I am. He's the only thing that in the midst of, regardless of circumstance, you're never going to lose him. Regardless of relationships that have come or that have been broken, you're never going to lose him. Regardless of your mistakes, regardless of the things that you've done that you hold on to so much shame for, you're never going to lose him because he's just always there because he is the I am. These things can be, many of them are good, right? Many of them are good. But all of them can become an idol, taking the place of God in your life. So here's what I got to challenge you with today, okay? I actually had a bunch more. I think I'm going to have to finish this sermon next week, okay? Because I have a bunch more. So here's what I'm going to leave you with today, okay? I didn't realize that would take so long, but it's awesome, okay? It's going to look so awesome on the video watching all this stuff hit me, okay? Here's what I want to challenge you with. Are you satisfied in Christ? Is he the first satisfaction that you see? Listen, I want you to have great relationships. I want you to enjoy football. Okay? I do. I do. I enjoy it. I'm going to go to the movie and enjoy myself. I'm going to eat popcorn, drink Dr. Pepper, and I'm going to watch him kick Thanos' butt. Okay? It's going to be awesome. But listen, if you're existing for this stuff, you're missing something. And if you look at Jesus and say, I don't think you can sa- he can satisfy me, the problem is, is that he's, it's not that he's not able to satisfy you, is that you probably just don't know who he is. You just don't get what he means for you. So here's what I want to challenge you to do. If you caught the first part of the sermon, you got to come back next week. Okay? Please come back next week because we're going to finish this out. Oh, it's on the blue card. Didn't even plan that. Awesome. Come back next week. Okay? Why don't everyone pull out your blue cards real quick? Pull out your blue cards real quick. These are our next steps, okay? We're going to talk more about this next week. We're going to talk more about what it means to abide, what it means for God to be the gardener and prune. We're going to talk more about this next week. But what I want you to think about this week is what are you doing to put yourself in the presence of Christ? Okay. And when you get there, do you find satisfaction? Are you satisfied in Jesus Christ? Go home with that question and come back, and we're going to answer it more. Okay. On there, just so you know, there's a Bible study if you're interested in being a part of this study. Uh, we have a Bible. There's a Bible app online that's for free. I'd love for you to download. Don't download that. Can we put the slide up there, Dan? Okay. It's called Joy. Okay, excuse me. Thank you. But you can download this app and you can look for this reading plan that we have for you. Also, if uh, you don't like the digital stuff, we have a 
we have copies of it at the Welcome Center for you.